We're getting some new gadgets. <laughs> oh, <it's> recording. <laughs> we uh, hardly know each night where we're going to be at. <laughs> That's the, I think the, about the third move in the last four nights. So we get another move, I think, tomorrow night. <laughs> that part makes it awfully bad. It's kind of shifting around from place to place. And you know, hardly, it's just like a new place every night. And it makes it very hard. I trust that sometime when I come back again to open, or well, maybe we can get something like the auditorium here for a week or two. That's right. That's when we can have a real revival and a real meeting. Don't you believe that? Yeah. yeah. I believe we could do it. Just our schedule has been so irregular. Well, I would say this. We're just a night or two here and then a hundred miles farther. Just about the time we get the thing that people settle down to where they can begin to see the supernatural moving of God, then it, they break up the meeting, go somewhere else two, three, four hundred miles farther and start again. And just when the people are becoming into the revival stage where they can be healed and many things can be done. So I think after I get back now from Canada, well, before we go to Mexico or anywhere, I think we'll just make the revival places stay about a month at a time in a place or something like that so we can just really get the people, when they can stay long enough to some of the people that pray for, will be, begin to come in reports, coming in, getting well, getting well, like that and testimonies going. Like in my own hometown in Jeffersonville, Indiana, watch nothing there. I just see if you come into town, hundreds of people flock from everywhere because they have, they are, you're settled down to one place, you're not on the move like this. And then, friends, this is it's about six months I've been going day and night almost. Today I had a wonderful day alone with God. And no one was there but just the Lord and I. And I get myself more settled down when I get alone. Now I've got five more meetings before I have any arrest coming up. Five more meetings. And then in the month of May, I'm going to take a complete move. Going up into the Rocky Mountains for my alone, there you can look like, you know, I like to be alone with God. That's the way to, that I find him so dear to me. And then coming back then to start into Canada. Now, we do not have much time. What time do we have to close for? 7 o'clock? 11 o'clock, I think, is, is the closing of the auditorium. So, I wish to speak to you tonight just for... Just take a little bit of time and teach the word of faith, and that you might know how to approach God. There's many of these great, deep subjects that people claim that they know much about, and when it comes down to the final showdown, they know very little of it. Now, that's true, and we're going to find out a few of those things tonight. And by the way, day after tomorrow night at the other auditorium, um, to give a little sketch of my life story. That is if you'd like to hear it. Would you like to hear it? Let's see your hand. Yes. That's just fine. Have you announced where the auditorium is? Reasonable idea. Because I want you to be you. That's what I'm here for. Uh, this is a great sacrifice for me to be here, friends. I have a home, a family, and I'm new, I'm just a, a baby in the work. This is just a few months since the gift of healing came to me. I don't have, I don't own my home, I just live in two rooms in a little L cottage. My wife packs water for somewhat, almost a half a city block, packs it back out of the house again. I've been all the wonderful homes in different cities where they tell me, I'll build you a home worth five thousand dollars, just give it to you. Mm -hmm. Friend, it isn't money with me. I, I'm, I wish I never even had to think about it. And that's the reason that many of you send or offer me your gifts. I, I don't take them. Because it's not your your finance. I want your confidence. Amen. I'm here for your healing. As I stand about the little home, wife and two children, I would, I'd love to be with you tonight. Just about now, it's 11 o'clock. 
That faithful little one's on her knees praying for me now. She knows it's just that time starting the service. Lovely old mother, she's praying for me. A little boy, his mother died when he was just three years old, he's praying for me. And somehow when I come into the pulpit, I just feel that their prayers will be answered. And I know he's near. You know how I like to see him tonight when I left them at the plane coming? A few months ago, they were holding onto my coat and crying. A doctor in my church told me I wouldn't live but about a year longer, said at the rate I was going, I would drop some night in a heart attack in the pulpit, and the little boy is afraid of that, so he just cries and says, Daddy, don't go. But there's something called out to the sick and suffering. And friends, I can only help you if you believe me. That's the only way I can ever do anything for you. And I would love to be there tonight. You don't know how I would like. Many of you know what it is to be away from home, don't you? Uh, it's just it's just a little shack, but it doesn't take a big house to make a home. It's the character on the inside that makes a home. And I'm thankful for a home. <laughs> so God bless you, and you pray for me. I'll tell you more about it day after tomorrow night. And now tonight, friends, if you will keep the little fellow just as patient as you can, and you be the same. And give me your undivided attention just for a few moments, and I'll try to explain to you the best of my knowledge the reason I'm here tonight and how that you must approach God to receive your healing. I've suffered much, and I know what it is to be sick, and I, I want to help you, and I can if you'll just believe. I wish to take this opportunity just now. I have so many things on my mind. And tired and weary, but I want to thank the minister, I just forget his name, of who let us have this auditorium tonight, I think, giveaway service, Jack Walker. Reverend Jack Walker, if he's in the audience, Brother Walker, may God bless you, my brother, and you and your, may you, Father. We're so thankful for this, another opportunity tonight to stand before your lovely people to speak to them concerning the day and the hour that we're living. Just before the coming of thy beloved Son to take away a church, a called out people that's blood washed, born the second time, and ready to go meet a whole God, a way bridge for them by the blood of the whole Christ of God. Bless us tonight together as we wait for thy divine presence. And may the angel that thou didst send into the room that night to speak to thy servant. And the reason of being here tonight, may he stand on the pulpit of thy humble servant tonight and confirm every word that spoke. And may great times and wonders follow. Bless the minister, Father, Brother Walker, who gave us the auditorium tonight. Yes, yes. He and his, may they be blessed, making successful in our ministry a fruitful branch, and may you have many trophies to lay at your feet at that great day. Bless the minister that's sponsoring this program here in the city, Brother Mars, all the other ministers, the co workers. Oh, God, may their churches be flames of fire, testimonies for the glory of God in this last evil days that we're living in the shadows just before the coming of the just one. All speak tonight, Father, in a great way to the people, and may there be faith, and may the Holy Spirit take his wings across this auditorium tonight, and may virtue come in such a way that many, many great miraculous healings may be done that his fame may be spread forth in the regions up and down this western coast of this hemisphere. For we ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. Our friends, as I say, we're shifted about so many times. I guess many of you here never even hear how the gift of divine healing comes. But the only thing I want you to do tonight is to believe me. If you will believe, you shall see God's glory, I'm sure. 
the success has not been as I hoped it would be in the last few nights, though, crippled, affliction, deaf, dumb, lame, but it's very slow, it seems to be, since we've hit the West Coast. Brother Charles Fuller was speaking to me when I was down at Long Beach, and he told me, he said, Brother Branham, said, the reason, said, this West Coast here has everything under the name of divine healing. That they have blue flame worshipers, Father Divine worship, and all, everything under the name of divine healing. That it's such a stumbling block. Well, that, that may be so, friends, I do not know, but that does not counteract God's power to heal. And the healer divine. And now, no man can do a miracle in his name that can speak right of him. That's what he said. So, if anybody is getting people healed, I'm thankful for it. But I truly believe with all my heart, as we go into the subject tonight, that you maybe, if God will just help us, that you'll get the vision and see what really the day and time that we're living, and then you'll see and believe. May God help us as I read some of the scriptures now. Over in the book of Hebrews, 11th chapter, we will begin and read the first three verses. Listen very closely. Because my words are just the words of a mortal. They will fail, but God's word will never fail. It's always true. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Through faith we understand that the world is framed by the word of God. For the things which are seen were made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained the witness he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by it being dead yet faith. The yeah, system's a little bit loud, so. All right, I think that may be just a little, a little better. Kind of causes a rebound. From... <clears throat> now, I wish to take my text out of the third chapter, the third verse rather, and the last one of the last phases. God testifying of His gift. And now, for my subject is found in the first chapter, the first verse rather. Pardon me. The first verse. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This day that we're living in is such a day of unsettled peace and unsettled rest everywhere. People are running to and fro, seeking whatever they may seek. Most anybody can get a following, no matter what they teach or think, somebody will listen to them. And it's the day that the prophets spoke of. People, when they're hungry, they'll eat from anywhere. If children and people are starving, they'll eat from a garbage can that wants to eat from a nice table. But if they're hungry, they'll eat somewhere. So I think real true ministers of the gospel ought to be up and going, ought to be giving the people the right thing, meat in due season. Now, this subject of mine, uh, as I have testified to you that I am not a preacher, I just merely have the gift of divine healing, which I humbly say it comes from God. I have nothing to do with it coming. I was, it was foreordained of God years and years ago. I had nothing to do with it as brought. What is a keynote to the scripture? Faith. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith it is impossible to please God. This world was made by faith. Things were shaped in existence by faith. God just seen that dewdrop hanging out there in the air, that whatever you want to call it. And he just spake and said, let there be light, and there was light, and then he brought the land forth and dried it off. And so forth. That was all done by an act of faith with God. 
The whole world is made by faith. You're here tonight by faith. Many of you told your employer you'd uh, be back tomorrow to work. How do you know you will? You told your wife, I'll be home after service. How do you know you will? You told a person maybe to come a cab to pick you up at 11 o'clock. How do you know you'll be here? You may be in eternity before 11 o'clock tonight. See, it's all by faith. Everything's by faith. Now, so many people speak of this subject, faith, and know so little of it. Now listen, friends, I, I love you and I want you to see this. There's so many people speak that faith doesn't know one principle of faith. Now, you're together, and I, we may never all meet again this side of eternity, but I, if I had a place where we could be together and I could gradually bring the thing up to where you'd be able to sit plainer than what you will now, because many of you are going to think, and you're probably many will get the wrong impression of me tonight when I'm trying my best to get this to you, and you'll think it's self-exaltation, but it is not, my lovely friend. It's for your benefit if I can just get you to see what, what God has done for you. Now, some, many people come to the line and they say, oh, I have faith to be healed. And friends, when you pass by, I know they haven't enough faith to cure a toothache. That's right. And some of them come in through with a cancer and say, I have faith to be healed. They do not have faith. The scripture lesson tonight said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, it's the substance. It's something direct, something that you really have, not something that you imagine, something that you think you have, but it's some direct positive act that you have. You see what I mean? Now, here not long ago, I'll give you a little story of someone who came so you can see what faith is. Faith is a gift of itself. You may have a portion of it, but there is a gift of faith. It's like some of you people anoint the sick and pray for them, and you have a result. That isn't a gift of healing. That is a portion of faith. That is a direct gift of healing. Well, there's only one direct gift of healing. There's only one direct gift of faith. There's only one direct gift of, of miracles and so forth. There was in the Scripture. The apostles had it. Many, they'd done many mighty works of Philip and all of them. There was one gift of healing. Like when we leave the city, as many people say, I've been listening some places after less than maybe 15 or 20, say, the Lord gave me the gift of healing. Well, God bless their hearts. Some of them say, Brother Bram, will you lay your hands upon me that I get the gift of healing? I wish I could. I have every one of you pass right down this line here tonight, and I'll say there wouldn't be a sick person left in Oakland in a few weeks from now. That's right, but it's not mine to give. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let's take that part of the scripture, the substance of things hoped for. There's three things, hope, charity, and faith. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Now, hope is one element. Faith is another element, and charity is another element. Charity is love. I've seen many people come by, lovely people, real Christians, but didn't have enough faith to be healed, and some sinner passed by and had the faith to be healed. See? It's another element altogether. It's not how well you serve God. It's uh, an element that you possess yourself. Now, I want you to see this because it's for your benefit. Here. A few weeks ago, a few months ago it was, I was home for just a few nights. And my, there's about 300 people had gathered in the home and around in the yard that day. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, the wife got into bed. And while I was just laying across the bed, my, my legs were cramping and hurting. I was laying down there and I heard a machine drive up out front. And I said, oh my, there's someone coming. And she said, well, Listen, I'll go up the door, and while she was on the road to the door, I went to sleep. And I could hear someone saying, well, the baby has been sick for a long time. The little baby was crying till it didn't even sound like it was human. Something like you that's reading my little book, A Heavenly Vision. How many really do the audience? Let's see. A uh, Heavenly Vision, you see. Something on that order, the little bitty fellow, it was about eight, ten weeks old, and it was, it never stopped crying. And the mother said, well, I, I, we've traveled all day and all night to get here. That we seen where his brother Bram was, he's home, and he brought the baby. My poor little thing, I couldn't sleep. And I went out there and prayed for the little baby, and I sat down 
and there in a chair just a moment was talking to the mother. They came from northern Ohio, and while we were sitting there, friends, the little fellow ceased to cry. He'd been crying day and night now. Oh, that's worth more to me than all the money of the world. And there, I looked over, and the mother started crying, great big tears dripping off on the little blanket. The old dad sitting there in the pair of overhauls on, probably spent a good portion of his living to come. Come over and put his arm around him. So I love you, Brother Branham. Mm -hmm. Some of the best hearts that ever beat on an old blue shirt. That's right. It ain't the way you dress, it's what's on the inside of you. That's right. And there, I knew he meant that. That wasn't hypocrisy. He meant that from his heart. He loved me. And I looked at the little baby, and the mother when I went in the other room. She was kind of and he's just smiling at it and praying. That's worth every bit of it, isn't it? That's right. That's worth all of it. And then they said, my wife said, well, I'll pick some coffee or something for you uh, if you wish. And they said, well, we'll just wait a little while. My wife said, well, now, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll lay down here on this chair and you let the mother and them go to bed and sleep for a little bit. And so we put them in the bed and I was sitting in a chair to try to rest for daylight. And just then another car drove up and a young man came up the door and he said, Brother Branham? I said, yes, I was trying to get away. He said, I know you're very sleepy. He said, yes, sir. He told me, he said, I'm from Ringo, Indiana. He said, my little sister is dying with appendicitis. She should be operated this morning. So will you come here? Well, and in my old jalopy Ford, waiting for me over at Houston, all the side of it beat out with my knees, where I'd hit my knees like that, trying to stay awake while I was going pray for the sick people. I've left one meeting room to the other, and you get out into the field with my hand out to the door of the car saying, God bless you, God bless you, sound asleep. I never will forget one day coming from Houston, I, there was, I hear a car blowing, and I knew I was on the wrong side of the road, only couldn't get awake, you see. I'd sat there 15 days and nights praying for the sick people and see wonderful things. But, oh, my friends, if my life will be short, maybe somebody else can stay because of my going. And this man said, young fellow, he said, my little sister, he told me he belonged to a church. I will not call the name here because it's not expedient, and I don't criticize anybody's religion. And anyhow, this church is my arch enemy. They claim that there's no such a thing as divine healing and so forth. And I was at my church, the Milltown Baptist Church, where I went to hold a revival. Many of you have seen in the little book called Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever. A little girl in there weighed 47 pounds, 27 years old, weighed 47 pounds, by the name of Georgie Carter, with two burglars. And she belonged to this same church. And she said, the people through the neighborhood said, let, she'd been laying on her back now for nine years and six months. And said, let her get well, and we'll believe it. But my friend, she's my piano player in the New Ham Baptist Church tonight. But do they believe? No. Even one raised from the dead, they don't believe it. Not only a man that laid in the morgue, pronounced dead by three doctors, when I went into where he was at, he's driving a Pennsylvania locomotive tonight, and still they don't believe it. That's true. That is true. They won't believe that hour is sure where people's eyes are so blinded with the care of the world and the other cares so they don't even see God. He's right in their midst many times and they pass by like it was in the days of Christ and they miss seeing him. And now this lady or this man rather, he said, Will you go? I said, Yes, he said, Maybe I'd better take him. I said, No, I'll try to stay awake and the wife started crying, she said, Now honey, you'll fall asleep somewhere. I said, No, I'll be all right, sweetheart. And I got in the old car and started trailing down. I said, I'll watch him going down. I was pinching my black my fingers. I'd take spit and wipe my eyes and everything else, trying to keep awake. I know that sounds very unsanitary, but I, I was doing anything to try to get to the child. And we drove about eight miles through an old road way up into the rural district. And there lay a young girl, something about eight, 17 or 18 years old. And she was lying there in a terrible condition. When I walked into the room, she was real nervous, and she said, Oh, for you, Brother Branham, she said, I said, Do you believe, sister? She said, Oh, yes, I believe that. I, I believe that. I don't care what my church says. She belonged to the same church as this Georgie Carter did. But I don't care what my church says. I believe, I believe. And so they, the man and the father come, met me, and shook my hand, and he, he took me around to the bed. He said, Sir, she's going to be operated on this morning. And said, 
and she's we're afraid she can't make the trip. Said we got to take her all the way to New Orleans, Indiana, and that's about nearly 40 miles to the first hospital, and she had about eight miles to rule, just old, not just a fancy rural coming like that, where wagons would travel almost to come down. And well, uh, I assisted and helped in operations, and and it was I knew that that child could not go in the hospital. She would die before she got there. There may be medical doctors sitting present now. Usually there is doctors come to listen on the service, and. Her side is pulling up and is turning red. The appendix were ruptured and were ready to burst at any time. Now, many times I went in with Dr. Adair, a doctor of our city, the one who comes to my church, and we had the operation and cut the incision open and wanted to burst on the table and, and sometimes take the bowels out and spray them off and wash them out and keep them from paranoia setting in and cut it kind of a V shape and put a tube in there to drain. Sometimes they get well. But that child could that appendix would have bursted and she'd have had 30 miles or more yet to drive and she would have died before she got there now friends the girl was looking to me and she said oh brother Brandon, do you think i'll live and i said i believe you will but she i said now do you believe she said oh yes yes i believe sure i don't care what my church says i, I believe georgie carter got well said i'll get well too i'm scared of the operation see just like that some of the neighbors are getting it in. Now, look, here's where I want to get to you people now on this. The girl thought she believed, just like many of you come down this line. You think you believe, but she did not believe. Now, many of you have email trouble and maybe something or another that uh, maybe an ulcered stomach, and you, you have to take your, you can have a little time. But that girl, that had to be emergency. Her life was at faith. Something had to be done. So I said, Sister, I do not mean to hurt your feelings, but you, you do not believe. Now, just like the brother says here, when you have your head up, no matter where you are in the building, I don't say this, friends. Remember, I'm telling you, this just for your good. It's not I, but God. I know when you got your head up. I feel it. You were here behind me where you are, like one last night sitting with her head up behind me. I knew it all the time. And so... That's between God and the individual, you see. I can't help that. They, they hinder the people. Many times, things are hindered. So then, this girl, she said, Oh, I believe, I believe, Brother Branham. Well, she thought she believed. Now look, she had hope. But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. You see what I mean? Now, I said, Sister, in an ordinary case, I said, I could have a little time and let you have time. Maybe to take about that much faith and go out with it. But you've got to have immediate attention right now. For I'm going to be honest with you, you will not live to see the hospital. Now, the parents didn't appreciate that very much at that time. But I'd rather be honest with you, let you know the truth. Wouldn't you rather I be honest with you? And remember, friends, I'm not wrestling with flesh and blood as spiritual power. I must be honest before Almighty God, see? And because I realize the danger of my own life, not only mine but yours. And so she said she would, she believed, but she did not. Well, I said, now, look, now I want you to notice this, and I want you to be real careful now and take up every word so you can divide it of a little something that God permitted there, and I, I'll see if you've got faith. I said, Sister, you do not have faith. She said, Oh, Reverend Brandon, I have faith to believe anything. If you have faith, I want to ask you and show you, uh, rather, that, that you do not have faith. Now, listen to correct every word of it. Hanging in the room from a chandelier was a string, and on the end of that string was a little bracelet. And it had this white bracelet, little red sets in it, where a child probably didn't playing with, you know, swinging in the room, maybe some of you have your own babies to be passing by that way, swing something around like that to play with it, to amuse them. And I seen that little bracelet hanging down, it was, I said to the young lady, I said, how far are you away from that bracelet? She said, approximately 15 feet. I said, now all you other adults here, all you people, just turn your back right around to me. I said, now there's nothing going on. 
be done to hurt anyone. I just got to speak to this girl because she's got to catch the idea now. And that's the reason I'm getting into these things with you tonight. We've got two more nights and something's got to be done. You see? Now, I don't want you to go away and say anything wrong about this because you might have to answer judgment for it. Mm. And so I said, something has to be done immediately. And I said, now, you parents, you just turn your back. And some of the neighbors are sitting up with her, and they all turn their back to me and turn their chairs around. I said to the young lady, I said, now, you tell me you've got faith to believe for all things? She said, I have, sir. I said, how long has it been since you've eaten? And she said, about three days. She said, I can't even keep water on my stomach. And you know what appendix is and fever on her also. And I said, now, if you believe with all your heart and you prove to me now that you've got faith, now you look right directly at that bracelet and it hanging there in the air, and you make that bracelet swing around and around in the room. Then you make it swing back and forth in the room. And then stop it. And I'll believe you have faith. She said, oh, Brother Branham said, my. Well, I asked me something like that. I said, I wanted to see if you had faith. I said, Jesus said, all things are possible if you believe. Now, that's just pure faith, friends. Magicians use it many times to play pranks and so forth. First class is the It will if you believe. But I'm trying to base your thought on faith so you know what I'm talking of. And I want you to sit still, and I so you'll catch this, wake yourself up, so when I get through this, you'll know what it's all about. Then she said, why, well, Brother Brandon, no one could do that. I said, oh, yeah, anyone can that believe. And she said, well, I don't believe that anyone could do that. I said, I thought she said you believe for all things. See how she was caught right there? I said, you said you believe in all things. I want you to prove it. And she said, I don't believe there's anyone can do that. That's material, uh, Brother Branham. She said, could you do it? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, could I see it done? I said, if you desire. And she said, I desire. Then, of course, putting my mind on it and having her to watch that and not me as many times in the meeting. I'll take any cross-eyed child you got in this meeting and bring it up here without even praying for it, and you let me look at it straight in the eyes like that. I'll make his eyes come straight. But when I turn my head, and I used it for an illustration, she went back. She thought she was going to get back to the line, taking two or three days before she got back. But when she came that time, she said, Brother Bram, you told me to get back in line. There's hundreds of people piling everywhere, standing in the well, way early in the morning, coming in soaking wet from out there coming in to be prayed for, and then when God healed her eyes there, both eyes come straight and she was normal and not rejoicing. You see, that's the difference from your faith and the faith of God. Now, then of course, passing my eyes through that uh, bracelet which you can yourself, if you won't doubt it in your heart, and it started moving around. And then it moved back and forth, and around, and crossways, and stopped it. She said, Brother Branham, she said, that's spiritualism. <laughs> I said, I, I thought maybe you would say something like that. <laughs> My, isn't it strange how people that profess they know God and know so little about him? Isn't that right? She said, you know, we belong to the Church of Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Excuse me, Church of Christ people. I didn't mean to say that. Anyhow, said, we speak where the Bible speaks and silent where the Bible silent. You know, you have that slogan. <laughs> I've questioned that a few times. I said, all right. She said, there's no such a thing can be shown in the Bible and anything like that. I said, I, I thought that's what she would say. I said, sure, that's in the Bible. And she said, well, I never, I don't believe it. Uh, all right. I said, you don't believe it? She said, no, you show me where that's at in the Bible. I said, one day Jesus passed by a tree. He wanted to find some fruit on it. There was no fruit on it. He put a curse on it. And the tree began to wilt. And when it passed by at noon, the tree was wilting down. Peter remarked and said how quick the tree was wilted. He said, if you would say in your heart for this tree to be plucked up and cast into the sea and wouldn't doubt it, it would obey you. Did he say it? And I said, he said, if you say to this mountain, be moved, and doubt it not in your heart, by and by, it would come to pass. 
Did he say it? Yeah. Sure he did. I said, I know your unbelieving pastor trying to justify his unbelief. He said that was a mountain of sin. But I, I went to school myself. He was kneeling by Mount Olives. It was Mount of Olives. If you'd say in your heart, yeah. or to be moved and don't doubt it, I said, how much more faith? And he said, if you had faith size of the mustard seed. I said, now, if the faith the size of the mustard seed would move that mountain, how much more smaller faith would you have to have just to move that bracelet? You see what I mean? Now, I've often wondered why he said mustard seed. I might drop this off. Mustard seed is the smallest among all seeds. That's right. But there isn't nothing will mix with mustard seed. It's all mustard. <laughs> you can't mix it with kale or nothing to make it grow. It's all mustard. And if you've got that much faith, all faith, not mixed up with something else, ask what you will. It'll be given to you. But it can't be wavering. It's got to be genuine mustard, if you know what I'm speaking of. All right. And I said, how much more would it take? Well, she said, looky here, I want to ask you something. She said, did God move that or did the devil move that? I said, neither one moved that. She said, well, how in the world did it move? I said, I moved it. She said, well, you're 15 feet or better away from it. I said, no, it's my faith that moved it. See? If you ask anything and don't doubt it, see what I mean? Faith, but you're a free moral agent. You're a human being. You can resent it in your heart. I couldn't touch you if you had to. Jesus could not be in any mighty works because of what? Correctly. See how little people know about how little people know about faith? It's amazing, friends. Uh, to find out how little people know about it. They talk so much of it and yet know so little of it. And then she said, well, uh, well you mean to tell me then what part does that play with God? That part there. I said, now look, there was an angel came down into the room and told me that way back, back when I was born, was foreordained to have a gift of divine healing. And he came and told me in the room one night, that God had sent the gift, and it was the gift of divine healing for the people. And if I could get the people to believe me, believe me, and it would be sincere when I prayed, that nothing would stand before the prayer. I said, therefore, speaking face to face with this supernatural being, I believe it with all my heart. And if I can get you to believe me with all your heart, that's what moves God, and then you're healed. Your faith has saved you. You see what I mean? Your faith to believe has saved you. Not what you worked up and thought in your mind, but what you really know, the very evidence of things not seen. You see what I mean? Then the girl said, Brother Branham, I truly know that there's something above where I have ever reached. She said, I'll try with all my heart. God have mercy on me. She said, let me believe. And I took a hold of her hand then. There was a vibration pouring from that ruptured appendix. Had prayer for it, and it stopped immediately. I said, God bless you, sister. Your faith now has saved you. A few moments later, I was sitting in the chair, and I went to sleep. The sun was coming up. I had to rest just a little before returning home, because I was afraid I'd uh, break up somewhere on the road and have a wreck. And I was sitting there. They called the ambulance, told them there was no need. When I w was waking up by one of the family, while the girl was out of the bed and had eat a pint of ice cream. And she's never had a knife from that day to this. She's standing on the porch and waved goodbye. She said, goodbye, Brother Brandon. Her testimony appeared in the hell of truth not long ago. Mrs. Edith Wright at, uh, at uh, the Milton, uh, DePaul, Indiana. All right. Now, you see what faith is? It's nothing how the friends. I know that all of you are at least uh, know this. This body is controlled by five senses. Is that right? Yeah. All right. It's got five senses and everything that controls this human body. Now listen real closely. Give me your attention now. The sense, five senses, is this right? See, taste, feel, smell, hear. Is that right? Them five senses control the entire human body. Is that true? Yeah. See, taste, feel, smell, and hear. Now there's none of them that declare faith. Faith is the sixth sense. Known to some people, if you want to, the middle of the left or whatever you want to wish to call it, many of them call it, many, but to me, it's faith. Yeah. 
and that is in and above all five senses of the human body. You see what I mean? Three. Faith is the only direct and positive sense, and it's the sixth sense. Faith is more than sight. Faith is more than feeling. You do not feel faith. You don't taste faith. You don't smell faith. You don't see faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Here, see this Bible. Now, I want that Bible. Now, I'm looking at it. Now, I want it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things I do not see. See what I mean? Here, in my pocket, I think there's an old borrow knife I carried for years. Now, I do not see that knife. I do not feel that knife. I do not taste that knife. I do not smell that knife. But I know that knife is in there. How do you know? Because I believe it's in there. Now, if it is not in there, faith will put it in there if it's not there. That jokes you, I know, but, <laughs> but that's true. If you believe, all things are possible. You're afraid to take God, friend. You're scared. Now, I might have left that knife laying on the dresser where I changed clothes a while ago. But just as sure as that knife is on the dresser right now, if I believe it with all my heart, it'll be in my pocket. That shows you. But God is able to put it there. If you believe it, here, I want to show you something. Come here, Reverend Kitchen. Is this this morning? Yes. Would you stand up this morning? <clears throat> I want to show you something, friends. Let's stand right here. You don't mind. It's not making a um, public show for you, sister, but it's for the glory of God. Now, look, friends, I want to show you something. Uh, I believe there's a, a woman standing in front of me. Would you tell me I'm wrong? You don't. What? You don't hear any woman. No, I don't hear any woman. You don't feel any woman. No. You want to know how I know there's one there? You don't taste any woman. No. How can you tell there's a woman there? Because the sense of sight tells me I see a woman. Hmm. Well, are you sure? I'm positive there's a woman standing there. Do you believe that I'm right? Or do you think I'm right? Now, is it possible I could be wrong? Yes. Every one of us may be blinded of our eyes. It might be a vision. Remember, the five senses of body is not so direct. Faith is positive. Now, I know there's a woman standing there. Because if the sense of sight tells me there's a woman standing there. You see what I mean? Now, you think you could argue me down and tell me there's no woman standing there? Now, you try it one time. You try to tell me I'm not looking at a woman standing before me. You think you could out-argue me? No, sir. Because I know this sense of sight is direct, and I'm looking at that woman, and I know she's standing there. Yet the only thing I know is the sense of sight. Now I want you to notice. Now I'm going to close my eyes. Now I feel the woman's hand. I can tell it's a woman. She has a woman's hat on. She has a woman's hair. It's a woman's hand. I know it's a woman because I feel her. You think you could out argue me? No. Huh? That's directly, I know it, that that was a woman. I've got my back turned to her, but yet I know it's a woman. See? Because the sense of feeling tells me there's a woman there. You see what I mean? Now, sight told me there's a woman there now. I don't feel her. That's the sense of sight. I know she's standing there because I'm looking at her. I close my eyes. I know she's standing there now, because, not because I see her, because I feel her hand. I know she's standing there. I don't see her, but yet I feel her. The sense of feeling declares there's a woman standing there. See what I mean? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, the direct positive, just same as my sight is positive, same as my feelings positive. It's the evidence of things not seen. Just as positive as that is. 
You see what I mean? Yeah. So many people try to work yourself up and say, oh, well, I got faith, but friends, it's not there. If it was, it would react. Amen. See? You know what I mean? Now look. Thank you, Sister Martin. God bless you. Now look. Now, I seen the woman, and my sense of sight said she was there. Then I knew she was there by the sense of sight. I closed my eyes. I didn't have sight. Then I felt her, and the sense of feeling said she was there. The sense of feeling was just as direct as the sense of sight, because it was a direct evidence. Now, faith is a direct evidence of things not seen, felt, taste, smelled, or heard. I look here. I'm going to close my eyes now. Watch. That was orange juice. You don't see any oranges. No. Sir. You don't hear any oranges. No. Sir. You don't feel any oranges. No. Sir. You don't smell any oranges. No. Sir. Uh, what makes you think that is orange? Because I tasted it. Oh. Are you positive? I'm positive that was orange juice. That would not have been lemon. It would not have been grape. It would not have been grapefruit. That was orange juice because the sense of taste, I didn't smell it. I didn't hear it, I didn't feel it, I didn't see it, but yet the sense of taste told me that was orange juice. You. you think I'm right? You're right. <laughs> sure it is. Why? The sense of taste proved that it was orange juice. Now, no matter how much you tell me it was water, I know it's orange juice. I tasted it. See? You could taste it, too. And if you've got a sense of taste, you would know it's the same. And if you've got taste, you know the same thing I'm talking about. Now watch here again. Now watch here. I smell perfume. That's you perfume. Do. You can't see any. I don't see any perfume. You don't hear any. I don't hear any perfume. You don't taste any. I don't taste it. You don't feel any. I don't feel it. What makes you think that that's perfume? Because I smell it. That's right. The sense of smell tells me that was perfume before my nose. You hear me? Try it. <laughs> All right. No, that was perfume. I didn't see it, did I? Did I see it? I had my eyes closed. Did I taste it? No. I didn't have it in my mouth. Did I feel it? Never had my hands about it or nothing else. How did I know it then? Did I hear it? No. I smelled it. Okay. And it was a direct evidence that that was perfume. I know it. Now. You don't feel any music. No. You don't taste any music. No. Well, what makes you think that's music? I hear it, yeah. and I know it's music. Are you sure about that? I'm positive the lady playing only believes. Mm -hmm. You think I'm right? You're right. Try to argue me out of it. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. I don't taste it. I don't feel it. I don't smell it. But I heard it. Yeah. Was I positive? Yeah. Do I know that I'm right? Why? Now, there is the five senses of the body. Now, they're positive, aren't you? Yes. You know when they happen. You know uh, you're looking at an audience. You know you're looking at me. Well, then, friends, faith, here it is. Yeah. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's positive. You know it. There's no need of anybody telling you anything more about it. It's just as much declared as any of these other five senses of the body. You know what I mean? How many has a general understanding now of what I mean? Let's see your hands. See? See? It ain't what you try to make yourself believe. Now, for instance, I try to make myself believe I'm hearing music. I, I wouldn't do it. May I make myself believe I'm smelling perfume? It's just not there. I've got to absolutely do it. You see what I mean? Yeah. And faith is that positive. It is an act of positive. You know it. Oh, my! I hope you see it. Yes. What I mean. See? It's the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. That's right. You don't see it. You don't taste it. Somebody say, I don't feel any better. Well, what's the matter? Why don't you feel any better? If you have your faith according to your faith, be it unto you. Is that right? Praise the Lord. See, no matter how you feel, you're healed anyhow. No matter what you see, you're healed anyhow. See what I mean? It is, uh, you know it. There's nothing to take it out of your heart. You know it. It's just positive act right there. Oh, my. If you could only see it, friends, something would take place. If you could only know what I'm talking about. 
something would react right now. Amen. See, it's a positive. It's right there, just as positive as these other. Uh, these are of the natural man. Faith is of God. The natural man can be wrong, but God cannot be wrong. Oh, my. Why would it make us go to shout? Think of it. And people tell me they got faith and say they can't believe in divine healing. Friends, if you don't believe in divine healing, you're lost. That's right. How you're going to, if you can't have faith enough for God to patch up this body to glorify Him in, how much more you go to have faith to believe that God will take this old model and make immortality out of it to take it up? That's a direct divine healing. Oh, my, there's going to be some awful disappointments at the day of judgment at the resurrection. That's right. Faith. We've got to get in such a place that we be translated like Enoch was. That's right. Faith. Testimony. To please God. Did that Enoch, the following scripture says that Enoch had a testimony by faith that he pleased God. Is that right? And the Bible said without faith it's impossible to please God. So you've got to have the same kind of faith that you believe and know. The gift of healing. Not a gift of miracles. Though well, many miracles are performed right along with it. But it's a gift of healing that people get well. They go out, pray for it, they come back, and my dear, he, wait till I leave the city, friends. After I'm gone a long time, you'll hear the people come into your churches and say, Oh, that cancer, it's gone. Yes. That, that yes. deafness I had, why, I, I hear now. Yes. My affliction, why, it just left me. It's just the simplicity. It's nothing you can work yourself up to. It's no excitement. I notice people come in line, just get to shaking themselves and saying, Oh, God, hallelujah, amen, glory to God. Don't do that. You interfere with faith there. You interfere with God. Come up forever and just lay your head up and believe. That's all. Faith, you don't work yourself up to it. Faith is something that's already in your heart. You just come and believe. You see what I mean? Oh, friends, my. I love you. I wouldn't talk to you so straight if I didn't love you, but I love you too well to see you get by without this, you see? You, you must understand. And now look. Now to my text right quick so we can hurry up. God testified of Abel's gift. God always testifies of his gift. Isn't that right? Now I want you to notice. When the children of Israel were in bondage 420 years down in Egypt, carried down there by Joseph, when they went down, by and by they raised up a, jo or a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And then the people got in bondage, and they had to make straw houses and bricks and things out of straw and stubble. And then they began to cry to God for a deliverer. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And they cried and cried, and God foreordained a deliverer. Is that right? Yeah. Moses. And when Moses came to the age of maturity, he went out and seen two Egyptians mistreating a Hebrew, and he slew the Egyptians and buried them. And the next day, when he met the Hebrews struggling among one another, while they said, will you kill us as you did the Egyptians? Now look, these white people, Moses, the very deliverer, God's gift to the people, they did not understand him. You see what I mean? They did not understand Moses. And Moses thought, surely, that they would understand that he was their gift to deliver them, but they did not understand. And now, friends, don't get me wrong. May I say this with reverence in my heart, knowing I'm an eternity-bound person who will stand before judgment someday. Thousands of people are missing their gift. See? They can't understand it. And they're looking and saying, oh, he's just a man. That's true. Was it God or Moses that delivered the people? It was God in Moses. Amen. See? They cried for the deliverer, and when God sent the deliverer to them, they failed to see it because it was by a man. But it wasn't the man. It was God in the man that dwelleth in me. He's the one that doeth the work. 
you see? But he was God's gift to the world. God gave him for you and I. Aren't you happy about it? Hey, look, God gave him. Well, now, the people that believe that God gave him, they can be saved, but those who do not believe it, they can't be saved. Is that right? And there's no other way at all to enter the kingdom, only by him. Is that right? Yes. Well, now, if you believe it, you can be saved, but if you don't believe it, you can't be saved because he is God's gift. Well, the scriptures say, no man, we know that God was with Christ, for no man could do the works that he done except God be with him. Is that right? Yes. Then what was it? God was testifying that that was his own begotten son. Is that right? Yes. God testified that. He said, this is my son. He said, if you don't believe me, believe for the very work's sake. Is that right? Amen. He said, if a man testifies of himself, you know how the scriptures read? But if uh, you testify and that what he says is not true, then believe me not. Amen. But if I testify that what I say is true, my Father will Amen. testify of it. Right. And if I tell you about a gift of divine healing and God doesn't testify of it, believe it, go, it's wrong. But if God testifies of it, believe it, God will it to you. That's right. You see what I mean? Yeah. I hate to have to bring this out like this, friends. I'm trusting you're getting between the lines of it. Now notice, see, it's God's gift. After Jesus, when he went away, he was taken up. Many people came to Jesus that never got healed. He prayed for many who never had no results of it because they didn't believe. That's right. They didn't believe it. He was God's son. They said, well, he makes himself God. Yeah. He forgives sins on earth. Bless me, don't you see? They said it about Elisha. Yeah. They said the same thing about Moses. While we would have died down in Egypt, we brought out you to starve in the wilderness. See, God's messenger has always been rejected. That's right. You know what I'm talking of, don't you? Amen. I hope you do, friends. God bless your heart. I, I want you to see it, friends. Oh, now, then they were in need of a Savior. God sent Christ to the world for a Savior. Then after Jesus going away, many of the beloved people of God were sick and afflicted. God gave Peter the gift of divine healing. Now, if the people got healed because God testified through Peter of the gift of divine healing, just like he testified to Elisha as a prophet, through Moses as a deliverer, through Christ as a son, he testified through Peter as a healer. Did he do it? And the people got the idea. And they even got such a mob of people that Peter couldn't pray for each one of them. And they knew that this apostle was God's gift to them, and he never shut their hands and said, God bless you. They took the people on the outside of the building and laid them down on the street, that even his shadow would pass over them, and it would be healed. Is that right? Yes. Why? Because they knew that Peter was the gift of healing sent from God to the people. Oh, I hope you see it, friend. Look. You see, it was God's gift. What now? I want to ask you, was it Peter done the healing? God is not in material things. God is in man. The Holy Ghost never fell on organizations. It fell on man. And so many people, they say, they don't belong to my faith. Well, if you're the faith of Christ, it's all the same. God doesn't care about your organization. It don't mean that to him. Uh, people's got themselves to a place of just a big organized world. And if that's the reason I'd rather have an auditorium. If it's in a, a oneness church of Trinity, it won't come. If it's a Trinity church of oneness, won't come. If it's in a Methodist church of Baptist, won't come. If it's in a Baptist church of Methodist, won't come. One, body, one person said, should we be baptized over now in order to come be prayed for? Mercy, that's as pagan as we ever had it. That's right. No! Right by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. That's right, regardless of who you are and where you are. That's right. So it don't make any difference what organization you are. You don't have to belong to the Baptist Church or the Methodist Church or the Pentecost or whatever it is. You have to have faith in God. That's right. Now, and frankly, you don't have to belong to no church. But if you get healed and go sin again, it'll come back on you again worse than it was in the first place. You go somewhere then to church and serve God. God don't heal you for the devil's glory. He heals you for his glory. Now look, how the people feel. Now Moses felt, I'd imagine how he felt. 
He just hated to come right out and tell the people because he thought it'd be self-exaltation. He thought the people say, now look at that man. We've had a lot of that in the world today. We've had a lot of people come to you and say, God done this and done that, but God didn't bear a record of it. But if God bears record, he will respect his gift. Is that right? Amen. Yes, sir. God honored the gift of, of Abel. He honored the gift of Moses. And Moses thought the people would understand, but they did not understand. And today, surely looks like a person wouldn't have to come down any closer than what you are right now to know what I'm speaking of. All right. But it goes over the majority's head. And friends, I love you, and I want to see you get well. Now, when they call for a deliverer, God sent the deliverer, and they failed to see it. Moses was God's gift to Israel. You believe it? Yeah. On down, Elisha, the prophet, they were God's gift. Many of them raised up false prophets. Right in the days of Elisha, they raised up false prophets. But God testified of the prophecy of Elisha. Amen. If it's of God, God will testify of it. Yeah, right. And there was Elisha, and he was God's gift to Israel. You believe it? Yes. Yeah. He was even Ahab's pastor. He was Jezebel's pastor. She didn't want to admit that he was her pastor, but he was the man who told her where she was living. That's right. He was her pastor. She hated him. But yet he was God's provided gift for her. Down there to let her know her sins, and she failed to see him. You know what I'm speaking of? Along come Jesus. Jesus, listen. Jesus was God's gift to Israel, to the world. Is that right? Yeah. Jesus was God's gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You believe it? And it wasn't the apostles. Do you think Moses was the, the deliverer because it was Moses? His wits and his intelligence? Why, well, he said he was a man of full speech. It was God in Moses, a gift to the people. Amen. It was God in Christ. He said, it's not me, it's my Father that dwelleth in me. Amen. That's the reason Martha said, Lord, last night's sermon, said, I know that thou art the Christ, the, the Son of God that should come into the world. She believed it. And there the people believed on him. And look at Peter, when he was walking by, why well, he was immortal. He was born of sinful flesh, just like I or you. That's right. But the people had need of a healer, so they sent God sent Peter to do that specific work. John was love. Peter didn't have the love in his heart that John had. John was God's agency of love. Yes. You see? Yes. Look here. When he takes Peter, James, and John. Hope, faith, and charity. Don't you see? Yes. Those gifted people. Them three. The hope, faith, and charity. Hope was in James. He was the one who set the church in order. Faith was in Peter, and charity was in John. Right. Hope, faith, and charity was God's representatives on the earth. And the people laid in Peter's shadow and were healed. Oh, yes. oh friends! Oh, my. Don't think I'm yelling at you, friends. You may think I'm excited. But I'm not. I'm trying to get my point to you close enough so you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, Pentecost people have been praying for the last 30 or 40 years for our gift of healing. We're living in the days when we got the best medical science we ever had. We got the best hospitals we ever had. We got the best doctors we ever had. We got the best drugs we ever practiced with. And we got more sickness than we ever had. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of precious saints of God suffering tonight. And they are crying and crying and cried for years for God to restore the gift of divine healing to the church. And when God moved the orbit 37 years ago and foreordained it and sent it, many hundreds of people are passing by without recognizing it, friends. Now it's brought to pass, I hate to say this, God have mercy. Look, friends, down to the rest of the country, over in Phoenix, over in Houston, over in San Antonio, down in Arkansas, down across the country, thousands.
thousands are being healed, coming through there, of all kinds of sickness and diseases. Oakland, know your day. One day, I shall meet you before the judgment bar of God. You will know I've testified to you that God Almighty is true. You cried for it. What? If you just as you respect it as you believe it, God will testify of his gift. That's right. He did for Abel. He did for Elisha. He did for Moses. He did for Peter. He did for Paul. He did for all. And he'll do it yet today. When Pentecost first fell and the baptism of the Holy Spirit first began to fall, the people said it's fanaticism. But God testified of it that he was so. That's why I'm with you tonight. Because I know it's the hand of God. Many of them went off into isms with it, but there's a genuine Pentecostal article. God has testified of it. That's true. And the same thing he's done tonight in another manner. And I was uh, going into the drugstore, and when I went in, I noticed some fellow looking at me kind of strangely. I went on in the store, and I come back out, and I had the bottle cap, and I never forgot about him, and I was still having my uniform on. And he put his, man put his hand on my shoulder, and he looked at me and said, Sir, the senior was an officer, said, I thought I'd ask you a question. He said, You may think I'm kind of crazy. And I said, What's the matter, sir? He said, I live at Paducah, Kentucky. He said, I've been failing in health for about two years. He said, Last week, I had a peculiar dream. He said, I dreamed that I should come to Jeffersonville, Indiana, and get somebody by the name of Branham to pray for me. He said, you know where any Branhams live here in the house? My. You don't know how I felt. I thought, oh, God, testifying. And I said, yes, sir. I said, I know there's Branhams live here. He said, you know, is there anybody prays for sick? I said, I'm the one. And he just looked at me like that, and tears going to roll down his cheeks. He just helped me by the hand. I took him by the hand, took off my hat, lay my hat and gun down in my hat, knelt down on the side of the street and began praying for him, right down the street. When I raised up, there was a mother standing, holding her little children back, and this man with her hats off like that, waiting for the prayer. There's been many things done in Jeffersonville, and they knew what was going on. And when we raised up there, they all were standing with their heads down, listening to the prayer. I raised up, and the brother, he put his arms around me, come in and pat me like that. I've never seen him in the state of that. God healed him. I was standing down at Houston, Texas, Reverend Kitson's meeting, and one morning standing there, oh my, how I was thinking, praying, there was, was having day service, and there was just uh, hundreds of people coming in the line being healed, and all at once was a lady ran in, all the buildings by law, there's this auditorium main floor here, and a lady ran into the back, she had a little boy in her arms, and she sat down, and she was real restless, and the prayer line about four and the breast was coming by like this. And she raised up, she said, just a minute, just a minute. And everyone stopped. She said, I don't like to stop that prayer line, but I want to tell you, she was real nervous and shaky, kind of excited. She said, I live over on the west side of Houston. Now, Houston's a pretty good sized city, several miles across it. And we were on the east side. She said, this morning, my neighbor, the mother of this little child, said her father was an old Methodist preacher, said he's been dead 20 years. And said before he died, he used to go around preaching and saying someday God would give the gifts back to the church for the Gentiles before the ending of the Gentile dispensation like he did for the Jews. And said his baby daughter, this is her baby, said she's kind of weakly and said this morning after cleaning up her house, she set her dust mop up and was lying down across the foot of the bed and was resting. And said all at once she had a dream, she'd seen a big black cloud rising and said, coming down out of that cloud, begin to move back, and said, there come her dead father. And he said, rise and take the child and go to the Houston Gospel Tabernacle. The gift of divine healing is there. Well, she just thought it was just a dream, never heard of the Houston Gospel Tabernacle. So she just laying there a little while, went to sleep again. And she dreamed it the second time. The big black cloud come, her dead father come walking right down out of the cloud. She said, well, that's strange. I've dreamed of Dad the second time. Said, he says, take the baby. Well, she got up and got her drink, stood around the house a little bit, and went back and lying down again. And when she went back, she dreamed it the third time. The big black cloud comes in her. They called the recorder's office to see if there was a what was to the dream. I don't believe in all dreams. Either. So then called and said, your young man shall see visions, your old man shall dream dreams. And then she... She called the recorder's office, and he said, yes, there's the Houston Gospel Tabernacle way over on the west side on 67th Street. And 
uh, east, uh, the east 67th Street. And the lady, the mother, so weak, she could not, now the child was, had an infantile paralysis, little legs is crippled, and she could not bring the child, but she had the neighbor, and the neighbor kept changing buses and cars until she got over and got off of a car just about two blocks from the church. And there was an officer standing there, and she said to him, do you know where the Houston Gospel Tabernacle is? I said, yes, ma'am, right up there with that crowd of people standing in the street. So they're having a healing service. Well, the poor thing was so weak when she got there. She, could, you imagine how she felt? Walked right in there and seen that. And she told me, I said, bring the baby. Oh, my. You know what happened, don't you? Sure. And I thought, even though the people, the angels of heaven know about it, God will testify of it. His works will be declared regardless of what people think about it. That's right. It's true, friends. God bless your heart here at Camden, Arkansas, with Brother Adams. I guess one of the Brother Adams are here tonight. And at his place, he was pulling me out. We had thousands attended the service, and they were pulling me out of the service one day. And I kept hearing somebody hollering, have mercy, have mercy. Oh, where are you at, Reverend? And I turned around, Brother Adams says, you can't stop the colored man, you know. You, even in Arkansas, if you even shake the hands of a colored man, they'll put you in jail. So there they are, it's that law they had there. You can talk to him, but don't put your hands on him. Now, that's not right. Amen. That's not. He's a human just as good as I am or you are or anybody else. That's exactly right. I don't know what you think about that, but I want to unload my soul about it. That's right. Sure. I'm for Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> that. All right. And look, there, this poor colored man said, Oh, Reverend. Brother Adam said, Come on, Brother Branham said, My, look at that crowd so depressed. They pull me out of the crowd. They don't mean to be harsh. But they try to take calls, friends. Sometimes you get around, they tramp you to death, they almost, and they just pull you. I love them. God bless their hearts. I'd like to stand right there and touch every one of them and pray for them till I just breath of leave out of my body. Last night when I left the building, they had to lay me out in the car almost, even my heart and everything, just shaking and jumping like that. You don't realize the strain of holding them demons when they come out and they're in the room and you're responsible. What if something happens in the building? Why, they lock you up in jail and break the meeting for good. Is that, see what you mean? You don't know the responsibility of that. And here, then, and so time any anyhow after six months of going, then I, I said, wait a minute. And he was just a crying poor fellow. He had his hat in his hand, gray-headed. He was saying, Reverend, Reverend. His wife said, you can't get to him, honey. You can't get to him. And I said, wait a minute, just a minute. And so I looked around and I looked at him. I said, what's the matter, sir? And Brother Adams, the other man, take me back up where he's at. I said, what's the matter? He said, Reverend, Reverend. He was holding me like I said, Reverend. Put his hand over on me. I said, yes. He said, just a minute, Reverend. He said, I've come a long way to come here. He said, night before last, said, my old mammy, she's been dead about 20 years almost. And said, she was a Christian woman. And I've been blind for better than 12 years. He said, and last night, or night before last, I dream of had sent his gift of divine healing, and it was a Camden, Arkansas. And for me not to let you get by, I said, Reverend, please don't pass me by. You think I could pass him? I don't care who he was. If God, I don't care how much he'd put you in jail. Then standing there by the poor old fella, take a hold of his hands, his eyes had been blown out by an explosion. Taking a hold of his hands, he was praying for him, his wife crying, the tears rolling down off her coat like that. She standing there after I got through praying. He just, his eyes, he looked so amazing. He looked around. He didn't bat his eyes. He said, honey, ain't that an automobile sitting right there? And it was our car that we were sitting in. Tears rolling down his eyes. Out of his eyes, he began to raise his hands and rejoice. Hey. Oh, brother, God will testify of his gifts. Hey. Heavens and earth might pass, but God's going to move. There's going to be somebody that's going to receive it. Hey. Yes, sir, if you come and respect what God has done for you. That's right. God will testify of his gifts. It's right now time to get started. Listen, not long ago I was in, as over in Illinois, and listen, while we're talking of the colored, this come on my mind. There was, I was in a big coliseum. Many of you know what I'm speaking of. And there looking around to see different things. I've seen an old colored man with a little ring of white hair around his head. He'd come along like this looking. And after a while he'd come to a, a certain thing. He stopped. He took off his hat. He held it behind. 
He bowed his head. I seen he was saying a prayer. And I walked up to him after he got through praying. I said, Sir, I said, I'm a minister. I said, I seen you praying. What was so startling about the box? He looked up at me, poor old wrinkled, hardened cheeks and tears rolling off the side of his cheeks. He said, Parson, he said, just look over there. And I raised up and looked over there and looked like a little old dress laying there. I said, I only see a dress. And that's what many people just see as a natural sign. Mm. I said, I only see a dress. He said, you notice that kind of circle in it, Parson? And I said, yes, sir. He said, feel right here on my thigh that there's marks of a slave belt. That's the blood of Abraham Lincoln. He said, the blood of Abraham Lincoln cut the slave belt off of me. Why well, shouldn't I take my hat off and say a prayer? I think tonight, if a colored man for the freedom and his rights could take his hat off to the blood of Abraham Lincoln, what ought you Christians to do to the blood of Jesus Christ? Oh, friends, I've expected to have more faith in Oakland and L.A. too. I tell you, the people that received it not long ago was the Spanish people in Arizona. Yeah. They caught the idea right quick. They knew it was God's gift to them. They come right on the platform, and I'd see them dear old Spanish mothers faint and fall and pulled out of line before they could get to them. Mm. They believed it. One of them come. She even had a dream that she she couldn't even speak English, and she's seen that supernatural being standing. You got the letters here, have you? Many. Why? God will testify of his gift. Is that right? Oh, friends, you know what I'm speaking of. Do you understand now what I'm speaking of? Faith, believe it. Come. It isn't the man. It's God in the man. You know what I'm eating? Oh, God, may people come tonight just like they did in the days of the apostles. May they come realizing that this is the apostolic time for them. This is the hour. That what they have asked for is now present. The Holy Ghost in the form of healing for their bodies. Granted, dear God, may many people be healed tonight. Have mercy, Father. And may everyone that comes tonight come like they did when they passed by your humble servant, Simon Peter. And they were laid in the shadow and were made every whit whole. Because they recognize God in the man. May they recognize God like they did in Moses. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. May they recognize God tonight in his people. Grant it, dear Father. Have mercy now and bless every one of them. And dear God, at this time I pray for my little church at home that just had services tonight, crying, begging for me to come home. Oh, God, people gathering in from different parts of the country. Take care of my little orphan boy, won't you, dear God? Oh, I'm out here striving, trying my best, dear God, to obey what I was told to do. And may the people see, Father, what a sacrifice it is and what you've done for the people. And may they recognize this day. And many be healed and get well of their diseases and testify through this city. For we ask it in the lovely name of Jesus Christ, our beloved Son. Amen. Amen. Praying to just fall from side to side. Oh, how I wish you could. You, I know you do. God bless your hearts. I just got confidence to believe you have. Let's all sing now while the band plays and all only believe. Everyone now lift your voice entirely. Come on now. Only believe.
is in our midst tonight? Praise him. Praise you believe him. That, you believe that he sent to you people whose cry for deliverance? You believe he sent healing to you? You believe with all your heart? Then let's sing this with our hands over our heart. Sing. Lord, I believe. Coming. Thou hast sent thy gift to glorify thy holy child. He's stretching forth his holy hand to heal by the agency of his church. Help the people tonight. While the music springs sweetly and softly, may the people believe. Father, I've said anything wrong, forgive me. I pray that you let the people understand that this is the time that you have testified. And may they know that thy servant didn't come because of my desire. It was your will that I should come, Father. And may they lay every skeptic mind aside, every skeptical thought, and come tonight and be healed. For we ask this in Jesus' name. For his glory. Amen. Now you're laying aside every skeptical thought. Have you done forgot all about your skeptic idea? You're going to come to your heel tonight. you believe it? Say amen all the time. God bless you, friends. Now they're going to take a picture. Now I'll tell you what happens to these pictures. I hang them in my room. Every night when I'm home, I pray for them. How many wants me to pray for you when I look at this picture? God bless your heart. Now, be sure not to miss tomorrow night's service and the next night, my life story, the next night, I want you to hear. And God bless you now while we stand reverently for a moment. They're going to take the picture. Now the photographer will tell you what to do. You folks will be seated now, please. But that balcony would stand would be so much better. Yeah. Make a much better picture. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that right, photographer? If they stand, it would be make a much nicer picture, especially in the balcony. Is that right? Sure. Shows a better picture. All right, the balcony stand. They want the balconies to stand all around. That's fine. Thank you. 